Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, today we have Dr. Fred Steinman. Uh, is going to talk about redevelopment agencies. Is that correct? Yep. All right. Um, go ahead, Fred. Take it away. Uh, well, thanks, Bob. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about redevelopment agencies and redevelopment districts uh, and how they have been used and are currently being used to support community and economic development efforts throughout the state of Nevada. Um, just as a quick FYI, as an assistant research professor here in the College of Business at the university, I have the opportunity to work with Tom Harris, who's the director of the University Center for Economic Development on a variety of economic development and community development projects throughout the state. Uh, and one of the areas that I have worked with local communities with uh, on um, is thinking about the various financing tools that are afforded to local governments, municipalities, and counties uh, through existing state law. And today, as I bring up the screen, uh, it's really my pleasure to talk about redevelopment agencies and districts as they're defined in Nevada Revised Statute Chapter 279. Uh, redevelopment districts um, in the United States uh, and redevelopment as a strategic economic development tool uh, really have a long history uh, in the United States. Uh, not in Nevada, but in other parts of the United States, there are authorizing redevelopment statutes and state law going back as early as the 1920s. Uh, in the state of Nevada, we adopted our very first redevelopment statutes, I believe back in the late 1940s and into the early 1950s. Um, and that was pretty much a response from the 1920s into the 1940s and 50s uh, to the growing urbanization of the United States. Uh, prior to 1920 and the US census, uh, decennial census of 1920, a majority of Americans lived in what we would define today as unincorporated rural communities. Uh, but as the United States began to industrialize and as our urban centers began to grow, by 1920, that script had flipped. And a majority of Americans living in the United States in 1920 were now living in, again, what we would consider today an urban populated metropolitan municipality or urban center. Um, of course, many of our urban centers had existed long before uh, that population shift. Um, and there wasn't a lot of thought about the planning of urban environments. Um, you know, buildings were built with whatever materials were available. Uh, they were situated and placed wherever. Um, and that led to a lot of challenges in the urban environment. I think today in the year 2021, we have a romanticized view of the downtown. You know, streetscaping and sidewalk dining and bars, pubs, and restaurants, uh, and outdoor social and recreational activities uh, like the downtown Riverwalk and the Kayak Park uh, and those types of assets. Um, and, you know, they become focal points for our communities. If I were to go back in time to 1920, uh, the urban environment was not that at all. Uh, it was a dirty, dingy, uh, very unsafe uh, environment. And redevelopment really came into its own in the 1940s and 50s here in the state of Nevada and across the United States, uh, really in response to those urban core problems and the need to think about how we're going to revitalize our urban cores, the heart of our city, uh, as more and more people essentially moved into these urban population centers. Uh, and in Nevada, our formal response, um, our formal codification of redevelopment and revitalization statutes can be found in Nevada Revised Statute Chapter 279. Now, it's important to kind of separate redevelopment, the process, versus redevelopment, the formal legal financial tool. Um, and as my slides unfortunately skip along, we'll, we'll make do as best we can. Um, in we can we can think of redevelopment as a process uh, that is used by economic development professionals and community development people and local city and county government officials um, in order 
for them to essentially take existing land that has been pre-developed or developed uh, in an urban environment and push it to its highest and most productive use. Now in the world of redevelopment and revitalization, I can take a vacant lot in say downtown Reno. And I can take that vacant lot, which is just gravel, sand and dirt and weeds, and I can pave it over uh, and make a parking lot. Now I've taken that land that was previously vacant and abandoned, and I've turned it into a higher and, and more productive use, right? Now there's some economic value by having a parking lot in an urban core, um, but that's not really its highest and best use. And given the limitations on the availability of land in an urban core, and the importance of urban cores, the property and sales tax base of local communities, because that's where you know your largest construction you know concentration is. You know you have your highest office towers and your highest hotel towers and your government buildings and major commercial centers and tourism assets really concentrated in a very very small geographic area as opposed to being distributed throughout the suburbs. Um, I really need to make sure that that land, because it is so scarce, is really pushed to its highest and best and most productive use. And redevelopment as a process, as an economic development tool, uh, is really the formal way in which we structure that process, uh, both here in Nevada and across the United States. We can think of redevelopment in terms of both new construction and adaptive reuse or revitalization of existing structures. Um, I think there's a misnomer when we think about redevelopment, we think about just taking a wrecking ball to the old and replacing it with new. Uh, certainly, that is part of it, uh, as we've seen in redevelopment districts and agencies throughout the state. Uh, once buildings really get to the end of their productive life, uh, there's really no feasible or economic way to extend the longevity of that building. Um, you know, it may be a building that was built in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, um, and really anything built prior to 1960, you know there's going to be environmental remediation efforts. There's going to be asbestos in that building. Um, and the price of modernizing a building and bringing it up to current, you know, building code standards may just be too prohibitive for either the public sector or the private sector to do. Um, so all that's left is really the teardown and the building of something new in its place to make sure that that land still has community, social, and economic benefit to the community. Uh, but redevelopment as a process has also been used widely here in Nevada, throughout the United States to engage in adaptive reuse uh, and refurbishment of existing facilities and existing structures. Um, you know, probably one of the best examples here in Reno, in downtown Reno, is the old uh, Riverside Inn. Um, you know, there's restaurants on the ground floor, there's residential above for artists, uh, right on the corner of kind of the Truckee River and Virginia Street. Um, on the south end of the river. Um, that was a redevelopment project that was funded primarily by the Reno Redevelopment Agency. Um, it was a building that, you know, still had some life left to it. Um, and instead of remaining vacant and abandoned, which it had been for a number of decades, uh, the city of Reno and the Reno Redevelopment Agency partnered with developers to revitalize it and essentially bring it back into productive use. Um, and certainly ground floor retail and artist space and residential above uh, is a really good example of a successive adapt successive, successful adaptive reuse strategy using redevelopment powers. Uh, it is important to also understand that redevelopment is a legal, formal way of doing things. And of course, in Nevada, those processes are codified within Nevada Revised Statute Chapter 279. Um, ultimately, however, if you think of it as a process or a formal legal financing tool, uh, the overarching goal of redevelopment is to really encourage infill development in an existing urban built environment, uh, as opposed to essentially allowing development to continue under the suburban sprawl model, uh, where we just build one new suburb at a time, gobbling up 
additional greenfield areas or areas that have been untouched by development in the past. Um, that certainly, you know, comes into play in areas like the Reno Sparks area where you're geographically limited. You know, we're in a valley, which means you can only grow your suburbs out so far until you start running into real challenges. Um, unfortunately, from a financial standpoint, if I'm a private developer, uh, greenfield development and continued suburban sprawl is often always cheaper, more affordable, and more profitable, uh, as opposed to going back into the urban environment, acquiring you know, many, many different parcels, doing demolition, doing re environmental remediation and abatement, and then building something new in its place. Uh, so there's a strong market incentive driving suburban sprawl, uh, but we know the problems that come with suburban sprawl. Sooner or later, you're going to run out of room. Um, it's far cost, more costly uh, to build new in greenfield areas if you're a city or a county because you're having to constantly extend infrastructure, you have to expand public services, you may have to build new schools and new public facilities. And again, redevelopment is really designed as a process and a formal financing tool to flip the script on those incentives and to at least make the cost of infill development for the private sector on par or relatively close to what the cost of development in the suburbs are going to be. Uh, underscoring all that is the idea of eliminating flight. Um, and again, you know, we have in the 21st century a very romanticized view of what the urban environment looks like. But that's only because we've had 50, 60, 70, in some cases, 80 years uh, of redevelopment and revitalization to transform the urban core into that romantic environment. Uh, but even today, there are, you know, large parts of the urban environment, even just here in, you know, the Truckee Meadows in the Reno Sparks area. But you know, in communities just like Elko or Las Vegas or Henderson, uh, where there still exists considerable, you know, social, demographic, economic, um, you know, dislocation and concerns um, requiring additional intervention to a certain degree uh, in, into that particular market. Um, so as we kind of talk about redevelopment, kind of keep those two goals in mind. Uh, one, we're trying through redevelopment to encourage infill development over continued suburban sprawl, and we're trying to eliminate or at least mitigate various blighting concerns uh, that may exist and still remain within um, a developed urban core of a, of a community or a municipality. Um, this concept of blight uh, is one that I get a lot of questions about. Uh, blight is a very specific legal term as defined uh, in Chapter 279 of the Nevada Revised Statutes uh, and in specifically Section 388. Um, so, you know, for you and I and the average person walking on the street, uh, blight carries a very specific, you know, but kind of layman's perspective, right? You, you know, blight is an abandoned building. You know, blight is a vacant lot filled with weeds and trash. You know, blight is, you know, graffiti on the side of a, you know, community center. You know, that's what the average person is going to think about uh, when we discuss and bring up the concept of blight. Uh, but blight from the standpoint of redevelopment has a very specific set of definitions. Uh, specifically in section 388, there are 14 separate definitions of blight. Uh, the first one here is probably what we would consider, you know, the layman's definition of blight. You know, thinking about existing buildings and structures, um, you know, be it residential, commercial, industrial, or some other purpose um, that have just fallen apart to the point where they truly are immediate threats to public health and human safety. Um, you know, part of the building is about ready to fall apart and into the sidewalk um, and potentially hurt a, a passing pedestrian. Um, you know, maybe, you know, there are cases of people, you know, squatting in the building, you know, and having um, unsafe 
you know, campfires essentially in the building to stay warm because there's no electricity, there's no, you know, heat, there's no, you know, infrastructure and services being provided to it. Um, you know, this is what we traditionally think about blight when we hear that word. Uh, but blight also means these other things. Uh, we can think of blight in terms of a general economic dislocation, deterioration, or disuse in that the structure may be sound or the parcel that we're looking at of land, it, you know, still has some economic value. But you can see over time, just kind of the steady progression down in terms of overall economic value. It, you know, maybe the diner that was popular in the 1970s and 80s, where everyone went to for dinner um, and breakfast and lunch, um, is no longer as popular because now there are many other additional options closer to where people live out in the suburbs. Um, so there's just that, you know, general decline. Uh, one thing that we see in the urban environment that we don't see in more of the suburb or suburb or suburban or ex-urban areas uh, is the constant subdividing and sale of lots uh, to the point where irregular shapes and forms of the parcel of individual land uh, begins to form. And as those parcels you know, are subdivided multiple times, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to use them for any type of productive value. Uh, this is very common in urban environments, uh, you know, especially going back to like the 1800s, 1900s, where you know, the average person may be land rich, but they're cash poor. Um, and maybe I have four sons um, and I am about to pass away, uh, but I own this parcel of land in the downtown area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave each of my four sons one quarter of that large parcel. Um, now, fast forward into the 21st century, if I'm a developer and I'm interested in building, say, a large condominium tower, instead of having to deal with one property owner to purchase that one parcel of land, now I got to deal with four separate property owners to acquire four different parcels of land. Uh, and that exponentially increases my costs and my difficulties. Uh, and redevelopment is again designed as a tool uh, that can be used to kind of address that issue as well. Uh, other conditions, and I kind of won't get into it too much, uh, but there's quite a bit of discussion in terms of light as it relates to inadequacy of public infrastructure and services, uh, as well as the general decline in property tax revenue specifically that we see in urban cores, uh, especially in Nevada, given the quirkiness of Nevada's fiscal system and specifically of how the property tax is structured. Uh, normally, any individual parcel over time will just naturally depreciate. Uh, and the amount of property tax from that parcel will decrease naturally over time due to depreciation. Uh, but we, we see kind of an inverse relationship in terms of services provided. So for older parcels and older buildings, the cost of providing public services goes up over time, but the amount of property tax revenue generated from it will decline over time. And at a certain point in Nevada, the cost of providing services to any given parcel will exceed the amount of revenue being generated from it. And redevelopment, because it's designed to stimulate and incentivize and encourage new growth and new development, and hence new property tax revenue, is designed to reverse that trend um, to essentially improve economic conditions, but also to improve the property tax base, specifically within the design designated redevelopment district. Um, other conditions, um, you know, certainly refer to things as like environmental contamination. Um, asbestos in buildings, petroleum products that have seeped into the ground, all the environmental issues that we see in an urban environment that we don't see in the suburbs or ex-urban environments. Um, you know, if I were to go out to, you know, the North Valleys here in Reno or Spanish Springs and Sparks uh, or some of the suburbs in a community like Henderson or Las Vegas, like the Summerlin area, um, it's new development. You know, those buildings were built in a time where asbestos is outlawed uh, and you can't use lead paint. Um, and, you know, there haven't been, you know, petroleum spills because a railroad doesn't go through it. Uh, or, you know, the amount of vehicle traffic isn't enough to contaminate the ground soil. 
Um, that's not the case in like downtown Reno, where there's been heavy industrial use over its history. You know, the Transcontinental Railroad runs through downtown Reno. Uh, the freight house district takes its name from essentially being a warehouse area to service, you know, freight trains stopping in downtown Reno. Um, there's a lot of environmental contamination that we have to deal with. Um, and that all increases the cost of development as well. Uh, certainly railroad facilities that have been abandoned or no longer utilized, um, you know, that have essentially reached an age where obsolescence, obsolescence deterioration or dilapidation has occurred, um, all part of the 14 different separate definitions of blight that exist. Uh, not to get too far into the, the weeds, uh, but in the process of establishing a redevelopment district, state law requires that a municipality or county that is considering establishing a new redevelopment district and agency uh, must find at least at a minimum four of these existing blighting conditions within the proposed area in order for the area to qualify as a redevelopment district. Um, so the process of establishing a redevelopment district the geographic area that is going to be the boundaries of where redevelopment powers can be used and where a redevelopment agency, which is the administrative structure of managing redevelopment activities, really has to be tied to these definitions of blight as part of the plan to eliminate and mitigate those impacts. Uh, redevelopment, because of its age, um, it is really kind of considered the great granddaddy um, of community and economic development efforts, not just here in the state of Nevada, but across the United States, especially when it comes to urban revitalization and the incentivizing of infill development. Uh, and as of fiscal year 1920, uh, there are 15 active redevelopment agencies or project areas districts operating throughout the state of Nevada. Uh, most of these redevelopment districts, for obvious reasons, um, operate at the municipal level and operate within established urban environments. Uh, the City of Fernley Redevelopment Agency is the latest to join this family of redevelopment agencies in Nevada. Um, in terms of disclosure, that's a project I worked on a couple of years ago, um, and they're in the process of getting the agency up and running in terms of its administrative structure and developing of actionable strategic plans uh, to really kind of tackle issues of blight and overcoming resistance to infill development within their established redevelopment district. Uh, but really, you know, counties have been, you know, less willing or less likely uh, in Nevada to establish districts. Um, if you include Carson City, um, as of the last full fiscal year, uh, there were only three counties as opposed to a number of municipalities in Nevada utilizing redevelopment. And that probably has more to do with just the way we structure local government in Nevada. Once a population gets large enough, you establish an incorporated or general law chartered city, um, and then the county really doesn't have any administrative control over something like redevelopment. Uh, but in other states that have large population centers and unincorporated areas, it's very common to see counties establish their own redevelopment agencies as well. Um, probably shift gears a little bit and talk about tax increment financing a little bit. And tax increment financing, again, like everything that is regarding, you know, regarding Nevada's fiscal system or fiscal issues, um, is a bit of a black box, or at least it can seem like a bit of a black box. Uh, but there are really three areas to think about when we think about establishing a redevelopment district or project area, and then a subsequent redevelopment agency and then utilizing it to mitigate and alleviate blighting conditions. Uh, first is the general process and the overall benefits and additional requirements of setting a redevelopment district up. Um, and then because it is the primary source of funding for the redevelopment agency, uh, an understanding of tax increment financing is absolutely needed in order to have a successful redevelopment project. Um, and then we can also kind of think about what redevelopment means not only for the area that's going to be redeveloped and revitalized as a process, but what that means for the larger community. Uh, redevelopment districts, again, are very narrowly and specifically defined geographic areas. You know, in the city of Reno, the downtown redevelopment project area one area is only about 200 acres. 
you know, the city of Reno is thousands of acres, uh, but the redevelopment of the downtown urban core is designed to have benefits for the entire community. Improve tourism, you know, providing an urban core where people can recreate, gather, uh, and commune at restaurants and bars and, you know, entertainment venues, public facilities, uh, has benefits beyond just the redevelopment area, uh, but for the entire community and really the entire region itself. Uh, as I mentioned, NRS Chapter 279 governs the process, uh, but the benefits, again, are really designed to be transferred to a much larger population than just people who live, work, and play within the redevelopment district itself. Um, as we've seen in a number of successful redevelopment projects throughout the state, um, you know, Henderson is a good example. Downtown Las Vegas is a good example. Uh, downtown Reno um, and downtown Sparks, all redevelopment areas. Uh, we've seen over the years through ongoing investment in both public facilities and infrastructure, but also the incentivization uh, and the partnering with private sector developers and new development, you know, new shopping opportunities, new living opportunities, increased entertainment opportunities are all benefits uh, that redevelopment has produced over the last several decades of redevelopment's experience in Nevada. Um, certainly, uh, we hope, uh, and there's good evidence to support the conclusion that successful redevelopment can decrease the costs for the public services that are needed in quote unquote blighted areas. Um, you know, you go through that list of those 14 definitions of blight, uh, and it's not a stretch to understand that if those blighting conditions remain unabated, uh, they are going to demand more and more public services. And those public services cost money. And that means a municipality or a county has to spend more money to provide increased services to an area uh, that is producing fewer and fewer public resources in the terms of property tax, sales tax, business license revenue, whatever, uh, over time. Um, you know, so that is all part of the redevelopment benefit package. Um, and then, you know, there's also an argument to be made that, you know, redevelopment, even if it's established by a municipality and through tax increment financing, as we'll talk about, there is an immediate and noticeable loss of property tax revenue to local schools and other taxing entities like the county or the state. Um, but over time, um, again, as I am able to essentially flip that script on the relationship between costs and revenues, um, the development of a larger property tax base over time and at the end of the redevelopment project's tenure um, will hopefully deliver a much larger property tax base back to the taxing entities. Uh, so kind of think about short-term sacrifice for long-term gain. Um, in addition to property tax revenue being improved, hopefully, uh, again, if done correctly, um, you know, through increased revitalization and redevelopment efforts, we do tend to see increased levels of economic activity. And hopefully that translates into new sales tax revenue and business license revenue, hotel tax revenue, gaming revenue, all the things uh, that the public sector, state, county, school district, city, other taxing entities depend upon. Uh, and again, downtown Reno is a good example. Um, you know, projects like Silver Peak in the parking garage at the corner of First and Sierra is an $11 million redevelopment agency project that was completed in the 1990s. You know, prior to that, it was just essentially an abandoned lot. It was generating no property tax revenue, no sales tax revenue, no business license revenue, you know, none of, none of that. Uh, but after an $11 million investment by the Reno Redevelopment Agency and the building of the parking gallery that sits at the corner of First and Sierra Street in downtown Reno, you have Silver Peak. Uh, you have other retailers. You even have a post office now. You know, those are generating sales tax revenue and business license revenue on an annual basis that the city, the county, the school district, and the state all share. Um, and, and that's just a small example. You know, we can look at the greater Nevada field where the Reno Aces play um, as a new generator of large amounts of property tax and sales tax and business license revenue, uh, again, all shared by various entities throughout, throughout Nevada state level, county level, school district, uh, and even the city of Reno as well. Um, 
we do see um, quite a bit of spin off development in the world of redevelopment. Um, so again, the parking garage and parking gallery at First and Sierra is a good example of an initial investment made by a redevelopment agency spinning off additional investment. Um, if you look at that corner of First and Sierra, um, go back 30 years and you had multiple vacant buildings and vacant lots, right? The you know building or the block where the Claudio condominium project uh, is uh, currently was an abandoned movie theater that had partially burned down. Uh, where Century Theater is, you know, was in a set of smaller abandoned buildings. The parking gallery was a vacant lot, um, and then of course across the street uh, you had an old shopping center, you, you know, that had gone vacant as well. Uh, but now with that single investment in the parking gallery uh, and some infrastructure like the Riverwalk, you have a $90 million condominium project at First and Sierra and Claudio. You have a $20 million theater multi-use building. And of course, the revitalization and reuse of the abandoned shopping center is a gymnasium you know, where people can work out and ground floor restaurant retail space. And that's all spin-off development, all creating new property tax revenue, new sales tax revenue, new business license revenue and new opportunities for new entertainment, new shopping, new residential opportunities uh, to service a growing population. Um, and that corner of just first in Sierra is a really good kind of microcosm of how redevelopment, when done well and done correctly, uh, can really translate uh, into expanded benefit off of the years. Uh, in fact, I say in the world of redevelopment, you know you've done your job right. When the private sector comes to you and says, good job, now please get out of the way and we'll take it from here. That's what redevelopment is designed to get to. Get to a point where we have taken an area of disinvestment and now turned it into an area of investment where the private sector is willing to spend lots of money on their own with any, without any type of additional incentive. Uh, redevelopment um, you know, as a funding tool has been used in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, to kind of leverage the resources of the agency with other resources, be it matching grants with various federal programs, uh, even combination usage with other tools like special assessment districts, um, or just the use of what we call tax increment financing bonds, you know, to generate a lot of cash up front um, that is going to essentially do the things we need to do to create that area of investment now um, so that we can eliminate those blighting conditions and create that environment of investment over time. Uh, and then if you're using bonds, the future economic value, you know, some tax can be collected to essentially retire that debt over time. Uh, redevelopment is a very broad power as opposed to things like general improvement districts, special assessment districts, tax increment areas, tourism improvement districts, and all the other things that exist in state law. I, I always say redevelopment is the great granddaddy of them all, not necessarily because it's one of the oldest tools out there, but because it's one of the most broadest tools. Um, there really are few restrictions uh, in terms of what redevelopment funding can be utilized for. Um, you know, certainly at the top of the list is the acquisition assembly and demolition of property. Uh, but you know, in the past, we've seen redevelopment being used in leverage with other assets, uh, being used to clean up brownfields, um, you know, finance commercial facade programs, uh, and even finance small business and entrepreneurial development efforts within the confines of the redevelopment district itself. Um, so it's a very broad power. Uh, there certainly is a lot of oversight and a lot of regulation within the state law to make sure redevelopment agencies and districts don't deviate uh, off the course uh, that they're intended for, uh, but the broad powers of redevelopment really makes it a very powerful tool. And that's probably why you see almost every municipality in the state of Nevada have its own redevelopment agency, 15 active uh, redevelopment districts and agencies in the state of Nevada as of the last full fiscal year. Uh, I'm gonna very quickly talk about process because this is something that you need to involve legal counsel with. And, you know, no shocker, I'm not an attorney, so don't take this as legal counsel. Uh, but the general process for 
creation and utilization is outlined again in Nevada Revised Statute Chapter 279. Here are just some of the specific subsections that I think are particularly important um, and that you should familiarize yourself immediately when even beginning to consider whether or not to establish a district um, and a redevelopment agency. You know, certainly the definitions of blight we've already covered, what is redevelopment versus a redevelopment area or project, uh, its creation and process, and then what is meant by a redevelopment plan uh, as opposed to an action or strategic plan. It's all here. Uh, again, this is really a conversation for you in legal counsel. Um, as opposed to just me, an assistant research professor at a university. Um, I, I, again, other things for you to just kind of think about, um, you know, you have to establish a district, a redevelopment district first, before you can actually do redevelopment and revitalization. Uh, and there are specific elements regarding governance of the district, as well as the agency, um, its max limitation on its duration, um, and even areas, specific geographic areas that are and are not uh, eligible for inclusion within a redevelopment district. A again, the details of this are far more complicated and detailed than we have time to talk about in this podcast. Uh, but understand there is a real elaborate and highly developed and finely detailed structure outlined in state law when it comes to these elements here. Um, so again, talk to legal counsel when you start thinking about creating this district. Uh, it is important to note that only a municipality or county can create a redevelopment district. Um, you know, certainly private developers, private citizens, other groups could petition, uh, but ultimately this is a decision that is made by an elected body, city council or county commission, and nobody, nobody else. Um, general processes, again, you start with establishing a study area. Uh, step two is usually go get a consultant with expertise in this area uh, to prepare and complete what we call a physical property survey of the study area. Essentially, that means going parcel by parcel by parcel by parcel and inventorying existing lighting conditions for each individual parcel uh, using those 14 definitions of light in section 388 of NRS chapter 279, and then trying to make a determination whether or not there's enough light to really merit uh, the creation of the redevelopment district and ultimately the agency moving forward. Um, once you've developed a preliminary plan, and the preliminary plan is really nothing more than an inventory of the blight, uh, you have to go through the process of submitting the draft and the final plan to the elected body that's a city council or county commission and the local planning commission uh, to make sure that the process has been followed, uh, that there is sufficient light to merit creation, and that it's economically and fiscally viable to establish the district and move forward. Uh, once you do that, you go through the normal public hearing process. Um, and then once you've completed the public hearings, uh, you get to sit on your hands for 90 days during the mandatory challenge period. And then if that passed successfully, you get to work doing actual redevelopment, uh, usually spending the first couple of years of the initial 30 year term, which can be extended to 40 or at a maximum 50 years, um, but you get to the process of getting to work by developing these action plans. Um, as mentioned, the redevelopment plan is not an action plan. It's more or less an inventory of existing blights. Uh, once the agency and the district is established, then you usually go into the process of developing your action plans and strategic plans. Uh, that's an important distinction because a redevelopment agency by law is a semi-autonomous public entity from the city or county that creates it. And those plans are going to be the ownership of the redevelopment agency, not the city, not the county that created it. Uh, and the reason we do that is really to insulate the city and county from the risk of engaging in real estate transactions. Uh, let the redevelopment agency take the risk. And if it falls apart, then it falls on them. Um, you really, again, wanna protect the city and county. Uh, but you can't do any of that planning because the agency doesn't exist until you establish the district. Uh, so that's why the public tends to get a little frustrated uh, because they're always asking, well, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do specifically? And you can't answer that question because you're answering for a semi-autonomous public entity 
that doesn't yet exist, uh, that is going to have the legal authority to kind of chart its own course. Uh, that said, the city council or county commission that creates the agency and the district, um, as mothers have said to children since the dawn of time, if I brought you into this world, I can take you out. Uh, and at any time, a city council or county commission can move to essentially eliminate or restrict its own redevelopment agency, despite its semi-autonomous nature. Uh, so the redevelopment agency always needs to keep that in the back of their head as well. Uh, there are restrictions on, again, eligibility of certain lands. Um, you know, the general rule of thumb in state law is that at least 75% of the area being considered for inclusion in a redevelopment area uh, must be improved. You know, there has to, it can't be just green fields. That's not redevelopment. That's not re revitalization. Uh, it has to be true existing developed land. Uh, and then, of course, you determine that percentage based upon the results of that physical property survey. Um, as, as I mentioned again, once the process is completed, uh, it's really time to go to work. Um, and that is a long list of things to do. Um, and there are many, many examples of redevelopment out there in, in certain projects. Um, very quickly, and I, I wanted to jump into tax increment financing because tax increment financing or TIF is the absolute bread and butter. It is upwards in some cases of 90 to 95% of the revenue that a redevelopment agency will collect over its 30 or potentially 40 or 50 year maximum lifespan. Um, and there's a lot of myths and legends uh, and misunderstanding of what tax increment financing is. Uh, in short, tax increment financing in the context of redevelopment is the process by which an agency a redevelopment agency will collect incremental property tax revenues that are generated solely from the redevelopment project area over the life of that project. Um, normally, property tax collected on a single piece of land, a single parcel, that property tax is allocated to a city, a county, school district, and the state. Everybody gets a portion of that. If you look at your property tax bill, it's a bit of a mess, but that's generally how it works. Redevelopment works by saying, we're going to try to grab incremental property tax revenues that are generated above the base, right? The, and the base is defined as the amount of total property tax that was collected in the year that the agency is established. And we're going to take that incremental property tax revenue incremental revenues that would have gone to the school district, the county, the city, the state, and we're going to reinvest it back specifically in the redevelopment project area. And that will hopefully generate enough revenue and resources to successfully eliminate and mitigate blight over time. Um, it's important to note that whatever revenue and property tax revenue that was being paid to the county, the school district, the city, the state, anybody who is eligible for property tax revenue, on day one of the agency, the year the agency is established, is distributed normally as is, as if there were no redevelopment project area in existence over the lifetime of the area. So it's a misnomer to say that redevelopment agencies, you know, are grabbing everybody's property tax revenue. That's not true. Everybody gets their fair share based upon the base assessed value or property tax revenue established in that first year. It is only the incremental property tax revenue that is reallocated to the redevelopment agency for the purposes of reinvestment, specifically back into the redevelopment area. Um, and, and that also underscores this idea, redevelopment, and I'll say this slowly because I want everybody to understand this, redevelopment is not, N-O-T, not a new tax. Redevelopment agencies are expressively prohibited in state law from levying any type of tax. They can charge fees and they can buy and sell property and they can even lease space to generate additional revenues, but they have zero, I repeat, zero authority to levy any type of tax. A new property tax, new sales tax, they can't do any of that. This is simply a reallocation of existing tax revenue and more importantly, future property tax revenue to the redevelopment agency moving forward. Um, the general theory is that 
um, as the value of the redevelopment district grows over time, that will create more and more property tax revenue. So my very rough sketch here, uh, consider the house in year one as the entire redevelopment district. Um, you can see that that initial year one house stays the same in year 15 and year 30. The money or property tax revenue generated from that single house, the same size in year one, 15 and 30, gets allocated normally, school district, county, city, state. But it is the difference between the initial house in year one and the larger house in year 15 and then year 30 that the redevelopment agency collects and then is forced by a law to reinvest back in the project area. Uh, of course, at the end of a redevelopment district's life, potentially 30, but can be extended to an absolute maximum of 50 years, everybody now gets property tax revenue from the larger house in year 30, which is a significantly more you know, deep pool of property tax revenue for the taxing entities. Uh, again, this just gives you a rough you know, illustration of how the property tax works uh, without redevelopment. Again, take any property anywhere in the state of Nevada that's eligible to be taxed from a property tax perspective. Um, a portion is going to the school district, the state, the county, the city government. The whole idea of redevelopment is to capture those incremental revenues and then reinvest it back in that property, increasing its value over time and then returning a much larger tax base uh, over time. Uh, hopefully, um, again, if done right, um, and if the district is created correctly, you know, with enough diversity, um, you are able to uh, capture some economies of scale. Uh, as general markets improve and valuation improves, um, ultimately your tax increment financing, and specifically the bonding capacity, is increased over time. And that leads to additional resources that can be reinvested. Um, and that cycle continues uh, again over the lifespan of the district itself. Um, I've placed here some just basic criteria uh, when it comes to tax increment financing bond criteria. Uh, this was given to me by a colleague who specializes in bond underwriting and specifically as it relates to redevelopment. Uh, typically, we're looking for areas where there's good taxpayer diversity, um, there's a relatively strong employment base. Um, and then, of course, you always need to think about the legal structure of how you're going to set up your TIF um, and TIF bonding uh, approaches. And again, those are questions for you and legal counsel, uh, not me, an assistant research professor. Uh, but these are some things to think about, uh, again, as you contemplate the establishment of the redevelopment project area. Um, to kind of wrap this up, and I know this has been a relatively long podcast, uh, long session, but again, redevelopment is a very complicated tool as opposed to all the other financing tools in the state of Nevada financing toolbox. Um, you know, the real purpose of redevelopment is, again, how can we benefit not just the redevelopment area, but our entire community? If we're going to continue to think of the urban core of the community as a city as kind of the beating heart. The first thing people think about when they hear the words Reno or Sparks or Elko or Ely or Las Vegas or Henderson, um, there really is an opportunity to collaborate with the public and private sector and even individual property owners within a redevelopment area to really build up an environment where historically um, there's been a lot of disinvestment and a lot of deterioration moving forward. Um, you know, certainly we need to think about, um, you, you know, the various pressures that communities face in terms of additional suburban development um, and how we can use redevelopment by maybe even pursuing new industrial manufacturing or major employment centers as a way of slowing suburban sprawl, um, how major infrastructure projects can connect a redevelopment area downtown core uh, to larger uh, parts of the community. You know, we're seeing this again in downtown Reno in the investment that the Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County is making in major transportation infrastructure, linking the downtown core with the university, 
uh, of Nevada, Reno, located north of Interstate 80, as well as major population and employment and recreational centers in Midtown and, you know, kind of the old Park Lane Mall, you know, where Red Development currently is working. Uh, and even to the major resort properties like the Atlantis and Peppermill, and even further south, all the way to Summit Sierra. Um, it's one way to think about how an urban environment interacts with the rest of the community as well. Uh, and of course, thinking about regional pressures as well, the need to provide additional housing, employment opportunities, and your choice is continue suburban sprawl or try to center that new development and, and the satisfaction or satiation of those demands in, in the urban environment and the existing built environment. Uh, so those are some things to think about. Um, again, redevelopment's a big topic, uh, but it certainly is a pleasure to share with you some of my experiences and my understanding of redevelopment as well. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. That was uh, very interesting and very thorough. I appreciate that. Um, you know, one thing you mentioned regarding blight uh, had me thinking of, about a potential new topic to discuss, which would be uh, Brownfields program. I assume you're familiar with that, but that's, I believe, another tool that governments can offer to developers or cities or, or whatnot. Right. And, and again, you, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of, you know, cross pollination, if you will, uh, between like redevelopment and brownfield development. Um, again, the urban cores, our oldest parts of our communities typically is where you're going to find the concentration of brownfields, you know, areas that have some sort of environmental problem, be it pollution of the ground, soil due to petroleum byproducts, uh, asbestos in older buildings. You know, you don't find that stuff in the suburbs. You find it in the urban cores and, and redevelopment in conjunction with brownfield remediation approaches uh, have been used quite a bit. In fact, the Reno Event Center, um, you know, in downtown Reno is a brownfields project augmented with redevelopment funds. Um, there was almost a million dollars spent on that project just for environmental remediation, cleaning and disposal of contaminated soils because there was an abandoned gas station on that block uh, and there were a bunch of abandoned buildings from the 40s and 50s that had asbestos in it. Um, so the redevelopment agency of the city of Reno provided a, a million dollars of funding um, specifically for brownfield remediation of that particular block. Yeah, fascinating. So maybe to be continued on that one as well. <laughs> to be continued. Yeah. Well, thank you, Fred. Really appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll see you at the next one. Sounds great. Thank you.